So there's a simple reading of A Midsummer Night's nice Dream. The play introduces four young people of marriageable age. It has two female and two male participants. This is set up for a perfect comedic ending with a couple of marriages right from the start of it. In Act 1, we are introduced to the problem. The two dudes both want the same lady. In Act 2, a solution to this problem is introduced. A magic love potion will make one of the men fall in love with the other woman who's been left out of the equation. In Act 3, we see the result of the misapplication of that solution, the potion, and the resulting conflicts. Finally, all that is cleared up in Act 4 when we get the resolution that we knew was coming from the very start of the play so that in Act 5 we can celebrate the weddings and watch Peter Quince and the gang put on a play. It's simple. It's comedic. Two dudes, two ladies, heteronormative weddings, it's done. In this simple reading of the play, the comedy is pretty traditional, pretty conservative. There are two female participants of this love story, Helena and Hermia, and they were close when they were children, but as they grew up, they matured into heterosexual women looking for procreative unions and abandoned their female friendships. The happy ending satisfies the heteronormative impulses of patriarchy. Two men marry two women. That's the simple reading. But that simple reading, it leaves out quite a bit, doesn't it? There are plenty of episodes that show us forms of desire outside of these conservative pairings. Along the way, two fairy monarchs argue over control of an Indian boy that they each desire for different reasons, but all those reasons have some homoerotic subtext. Additionally, the fairy queen becomes intimate with a half-man, half-animal weaver and amateur actor. Helena gives a passionate speech about subordination within love and desire, which is not particularly normative. And there is also that speech that Helena delivers directly to Hermia, where she says that they were both on one sampler, sitting on one cushion, both warbling of one song, both in one key, as if our hands, our sides, voices, and minds had been incorporate, so grew together like a double cherry, seeming parted, but yet an union in partition, two lovely berries molded on one stem. Does that speech imply that they were intimate in their youth? Our hands, our sides, voices, and minds had been incorporate? Is this describing a homoerotic act? Can we even discuss homoeroticism within a 16th century play without being anachronistic? Like, if the terms gay or bisexual didn't exist back then, what are the dangers of our mapping our modern terms for sexual desire onto the past? Does it even make sense to call the ending heteronormative as I did earlier? That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to go through some of the queer readings of this play and hopefully find some answers to these questions and more. So if reading Shakespeare thoughtfully and engaging with the text in thought-provoking ways seems like your kind of thing, please consider subscribing for future videos and seasons, and let's get into it. So if we're going to use queer theory today, we should probably start with an explanation of that term before we start taking a look at the text. And to do that, let's first start by defining the word queer. I'm going to use David Halpern's definition that queer is whatever is at odds with the normal, the legitimate, the dominant. There is nothing in particular to which it necessarily refers, which means it's a fairly broad term. There is nothing in particular to which it necessarily refers, because it always refers to divergence from the dominant normative standard of a given population. And that can change. If a community has marked a particular form of desire as morally superior or as having exclusive rights to the term natural, then anything that deviates from that particular form of desire is queer. The term queer theory has its origins in the 1990s, and its original use is typically credited to Teresa de Laurentiis, who, in a 1991 essay, said that she chose the term to problematize some of the discursive constructions and constructed silences in the emergent field of gay and lesbian studies. In other words, she felt that there were forms of desire outside of the heterosexual versus homosexual binary, and that these forms of desire were being silenced in academic discourse. Anytime we construct a category of desire, or a category for anything, we are limiting its possibilities. So if we create the category heterosexuality, we include some forms of desire within that category, and other forms are going to be left out or go unspoken. Queer studies exist to challenge those categories and to demonstrate the insufficiencies of language to communicate something as varied and complex as sexual desire. 
In doing so, it expands and validates a larger behavior space for desire. So what does this have to do with Shakespeare? To start, history is always fertile ground for this kind of study because it forces us to recognize how sexual desire has transformed over time. What were once desirable traits or accepted practices no longer exist or are actively and intentionally avoided. And recognizing that forces reflection on the standards of our time period and the possibility that they might change in the future, that hardly anything is a given. Desire has taken many forms in the past and it will take many more in the future. Like for example, the category homosexual did not exist when Shakespeare wrote his plays. He has characters that we might recognize as gay, Antonio in The Merchant of Venice, for example, but that term didn't exist. There is no early modern equivalent. When we use the word homosexual as a label for somebody, it comes loaded with a bunch of assumptions, and those assumptions may not accurately characterize Antonio in the play. There are no homosexuals in Shakespeare, and it's worth noting, and many have, that there are also no heterosexuals. These terms pathologize a set of actions, and the actions of early modern men and women don't fit neatly into those boxes created by those terms. They lived with different norms and different taboos. In the book Shakespeare and Queer Theory, Melissa Sanchez points out that two adult men sharing a bed, kissing, or embracing one another, or addressing one another with terms of endearment would have seemed unremarkable, customary behavior, not a sign of a specific sexual orientation. So Antonio's desire for Bassanio would not be shocking to an early modern audience. Like, you might have it in your head that it was illegal to be gay in Shakespeare's time, but that's a very confusing position. As I've said, there is no early modern equivalent for that term, so it could not be legislated against. There were laws against sodomy, that's true. But those laws included a diverse range of sexual behaviors. That term didn't have the same meaning 400 years ago, and as historian Bruce Smith has notably pointed out, those laws were very rarely enforced for the act that we now associate with that term. Like, during the entire reigns of Elizabeth I and James VI, a law against sodomy in the way that we understand it was only enforced one time, and that was an issue of consent. We also live with the assumption that marriage is the most serious, most important instantiation of human partnership. In early modern England, though, the committed relationship between two male friends could easily be seen as more important. Like the giving of women between men is an important part of cementing male friendships and commitments. A father might give away his daughter as Aegeus tries to do in A Midsummer's Night's Dream, or a friend might help his companion find a woman, as Don Pedro does in Much Ado About Nothing. The marriage between a man and a woman could be a tool used to support a more important partnership between men. The assumptions we have about the institution of marriage and its importance within the social order may not hold when we travel back in time. But Shakespeare plays provide further areas of study for queer theorists beyond those historical investigations of desire. His plays often undermine norms, whatever they might be, both the norms of the time period and the ones that we live with today. For example, Measure for Measure investigates and disrupts the view that sexual purity should be linked to moral virtue. But perhaps the most interesting play for this kind of investigation is A Midsummer's Night's Dream. A Midsummer's Night's Dream is littered with moments that undermine or expose the policing of human desire as either impossible or cruel. The play shows us a few different types of ways the characters can attempt to control the sexual desires of others. Sometimes it's through authoritarian discipline and the threat of violence. Sometimes it's a magic potion. And sometimes there is simply normative pressure of society, the coercive pull toward acceptable forms of desire and away from the taboo. And each of these forms of control are undermined within the play. A good place to start this investigation of desire and the control that people try to exercise over it is with the two patriarchs of this play, Oberon and Theseus. Clearly, they both want to control everything around them, and in particular, they want to control who people love and how they love. We see this from the opening scene. Aegeus and Theseus want to control the desires of Hermia. She doesn't love the right person, and she is given the choice to either love the man Theseus and her father demand, or she dies. So right away we see the threat of violence to control sexual desire, and right away we see resistance. She chooses option C and runs away with Lysander into the forest. 
Hermia's desire cannot be policed through disciplinary power. Theseus cannot actually control her desire, and by the end of this play, Theseus will have to change the rules that he established in Act 1. So, to summarize, a man in the highest position of power attempts to control the desires of others through the ultimate threat of violence, and by the end of the play, as a way to maintain his position of power, he needs to change the rules he himself made. Desire refuses to be controlled. And this is not the only time something like this happens in the play. Oberon obviously attempts to have control over everybody's desires. He has Puck find a love potion so that he can do just that. This plot device will certainly complicate the young Athenian love plot in this play, but its primary purpose is to embarrass his queen by having her desire something that everybody knows is undesirable. He wants to weaponize taboo desires. But in a larger sense, he wants to control the desires of his wife, Tatiana. She had a close and possibly intimate relationship with an Indian votress who dies giving birth, and in the play, Tatiana is raising her son. Oberon wants to sever this relationship between Tatiana and the son, and in some ways, symbolically sever the relationship between Tatiana and the priestess. So he has Puck apply some love potion to her eyes with the hopes that she'll fall in love with a beast. Puck arranges for her to fall in love with Bottom, one of the lowest status humans in the play who has been magically given the head of an ass. Oberon hopes to shame her desire and then leverage both the distraction and the shame to steal the Indian boy away from her maternal protection and join his tribe of men. When he actually sees her, his reaction is not one of celebration and victory, but one of anger followed by condolence. He says, Her dotage now I do begin to pity, for meeting her of late behind the wood, seeking sweet favors for this hateful fool, I did upbraid her and fall out with her. He caused her to fall in love with Bottom, with magic. Then he yells at her about it, and ultimately he pities her for desiring something so below her. He's the highest status character in the entire play. He makes the rules, then seeing the effect of those rules needs to remove the magic and seems to regret his attempt at control. Melissa Sanchez calls attention to the symbolic nature of the love potion used by Oberon, noting that it metaphorically condenses a larger dynamic of A Midsummer's Night's Dream, the patriarchal and heteronormative efforts to reproduce the orderly structures of marriage and procreation as voluntary itself relies on inciting desires whose objects and effects are unruly and unpredictable. In simpler terms, the love potion is an attempt to control desire, but the effect of using it shows the audience that desire is by nature unruly, unpredictable, and uncontrollable. But setting rules and controlling desire through physical threats or magic potions is not the only way these patriarchs attempt to control desire and steer it toward procreative marriage. In Act 5, Theseus decides to celebrate all the marriages with the performance of a play. And that play... Well, it, it's got a lot of queer energy. There are the obvious moments of homoeroticism, like when the wall that separates the two lovers is played by a character named Snout. The lovers whisper through a crack or hole in the wall. Since the wall is played by a man, you can imagine where that hole that they're whispering through exists. When they try to kiss each other, the male character of Flute, who is playing the female character of Thisbe in the play, says, I kiss the wall's hole, not your lips at all. His cherry lips have often kissed thy stones, thy stones with lime and hair knit up in thee. It's quite a scene, and all that happens on stage in front of Theseus and the other couples. And that's just the obvious stuff. There's also the play conceptually. The fact that the wall is played by a man at all is interesting in this context. The division between the families of Pyramus and Thisbe, the object that creates this binary opposition between two opposing houses, it's just a dude, and he moves around, he talks a bit too much, and he has flaws. So if we take this and look at it metaphorically, it seems to say that the walls we construct around acceptable forms of desire, who we are and are not permitted to be intimate with, those walls, they're as unstable as the people who created them. They're as flawed as the man who signifies wall. And we're not done. That's not the only conceptual way that this performance undermines the coercive force of normative sexual behaviors. 
The play itself dissolves binary oppositions between acceptable forms of desire and taboo forms of desire by showing us the limits of the language that we use to form those binaries. The play, for example, is described as a tedious, brief scene of young Pyramus and his love, Thisbe, very tragical mirth. It's both tedious and brief, both tragical and filled with mirth. This play cannot be contained by the language that we use to describe it. In the same way that people do not fit neatly within the heterosexual or homosexual identities, this play cannot be described within the tragedy-comedy binary. So in a lot of ways, this play is showing the obstacles to authoritarian control over human sexuality. It's got homoeroticism. It's got movable boundaries. It's showing us the insufficiency of language. And confronted with these obstacles through this play, Theseus attempts to distance his tribe from the tribe of the mechanicals performing the play by making fun of them. The play has queer energy, and by mocking the play, he can instruct his court to avoid the behaviors that they see. In other words, the marriages at the end of this play legitimize themselves by dismissing the world of the rude players. Kirk Quinsland notes that this last scene in A Midsummer Night's Dream reminds its audience that social constructions of heterosexuality rely on a repudiation of what heterosexuality constructs as its other. In short, the court relies on rejecting the mechanicals and their play as a means of constructing its own heterosexuality and its own aesthetic superiority. Theseus here is trying to create the taboos that will guide his community. It's an attempt to get his community to police themselves. If they ever find themselves acting like the players, then, Theseus implies, the best that they can ever be is shadows. And of course, there are the always already present taboos of desire in the play, and we can see those play out through the characters of Hermia and Helena. Hermia throws off the control of her father and her sovereign when she decides to escape into the forest with Lysander. But when it's time to go to sleep, she insists that her and Lysander sleep apart. She fears intimacy with him. And it would be impossible to name what that fear is. It could be that she fears for her reputation, and she wants to preserve the purity standard for women as she preserves her privileged position within it. It could be that she's simply afraid of having sex with a man. It's impossible to know. But we do know that she didn't fear intimacy with Helena when they were younger. When they escaped to the woods in their youth, their sides were incorporate. They were two lovely berries molded on one stem. So, it seems, sometimes the mechanisms of social pressure actually prevent the approved procreative forms of intimacy, but permit the intimate same-sex friendships. And while we're talking about Hermia and Helena, we should discuss Helena's pursuit of Demetrius and how it also undermines approved forms of coupling. Courtship often resembles the hunter-prey relationship in this time period. Like, Thomas Wyatt wrote a sonnet, for example, with the first line, Whoso list to hunt, I know where is a hind, about his giving up a hunt for Anne Boleyn. Men pursue women like hunters pursue deer. Helena, though, seems to want to be both the hunter and the hunted. She adopts the male position of hunter by following Demetrius into the forest, and in doing so, she takes away his agency and his privilege as the man to pursue her. But at the same time, she's begging to be subordinated, to be treated as a spaniel. She wants to play both parts of the binary, predator and prey, and her desire disrupts the firm distinction between the dominant and the submissive in a relationship. Which kind of reminds me of another character who wants to play all the parts. Bottom wants to play both Pyramus and Thisbe, male and female. He wants to be a lion that roars like a dove. He wants to see himself play every role. Bottom's desire cannot be contained, and indeed, he ends up playing every role. He's a man, he's a beast, he's a weaver, an actor, a sexual partner to the queen of fairies. He's both waited on by magical creatures, and he's made fun of by the fancy people at court. He sees behind and transcends all the hierarchies of power and control in this play. His presence dissolves the acceptable boundaries of desire. And so it's notable that he cannot explain his experience. His inability to articulate his dream at the end of Act 4 is an inability to put language to the complexity of human desire. And considering Bottom's transformation in the play, we cannot leave this essay without taking some time to discuss one of the queer heroes of this play, Robin Goodfellow, Puck. 
He is the agent of male patriarchal authority under Oberon's direction, but in that role, he's mischievous and an agent of chaos rather than stability. As he says, those things do best please him are those that befall preposterously. Oberon tries to use him to control human desire, to have Tatiana fall for a beast, to make Demetrius fall for Helena, but Puck is either unreliable or playfully disobedient. No one tells him to play his game with Bottom. That wasn't in the instructions. And when Oberon gives him a simple task to achieve a simple solution to the Athenian love triangle, he ends up creating more chaos by applying the potion to the wrong person's eyes. Puck is an intermediary between those in power and those that the power seeks to control. And in that role as intermediary, he chooses chaos. Whereas Oberon wants to control what people desire, Puck takes a voyeuristic and borderline sadistic pleasure in the passion of others and the illogical or foolish behavior that flows from desire. There is joy when he says, Lord, what fools these mortals be. Douglas E. Green, while defending his position that Puck is the queer hero of this play, explains that Puck is the energy of desire itself, whatever its content. Though at Oberon's service, he is an energy that cannot be fully contained within power's totalizing aims. His pleasures work against or at least inflect ideological constraints on desire, the very constraints he has been sent to enforce. Puck is the very possibility of the perverse operating within yet against constraints, of pleasures beyond such constraints. Puck, in other words, is queer protest within normative structures embodied. So many elements of this play expose the impossibility of policing human desire, and Puck seems to delight in that impossibility. So even though the simple reading of this play ends with some traditional marriages and looks like Theseus and Oberon have won, Puck, notably, gets the last word. And by giving Puck the last word, the play hints that there is more disruption to follow. We can trust that honest Puck will not oversee a boring normative marriage. Desire, like imagination, both of which sit at the center of this play, cannot be controlled, nor would Puck allow them to be controlled. And that's all for this season of Shakespeare Play by Play. I've already started work on the next season. This coming fall, you can expect something on Othello, Please consider subscribing so you can be notified when that season starts. Thank you for watching.